Hello, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, here to continue our actual discussion, to actually get into our discussion of uh, the three themes of the course. So let me get this going. Up to this point, uh, I hope you have uh, been able to uh, get familiarized with your My EPCC. I did send out an, an email. Um, again, if you have replied, I have given you credit for that. So uh, please check your emails. Um, and today we're going to actually get into our discussion of 1307. So you should have reviewed all your 1306 concepts. You should be strong with those. Um, get to know each other a little bit. Uh, I introduce myself. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to set up a group discussion board to, uh, to allow you to um, sort of introduce yourselves as well. Kind of run into a few glitches with that, but hopefully I'll get that ready soon. Um, we left off last time looking at our levels of complexity, levels of organization. So we've established that biology 1307 is not a cellular biology course. We've progressed all the way now to the organismal course. So we're going to focus on the organism as a central model and see how that organism fits into its environment, all the ecological interactions, all of the evolutionary sort of background that it brings to that environment as well. So uh, as we look at one organism, uh, it's not realistic, right? We don't just have one human on planet Earth. We don't have one bird. We don't have one cactus. It's, um, it's several of that same type, right? So we're going to get into the idea of a species. Uh, I'll introduce that a little bit later in the week. Um, a species, a, a type of organism, a genetically sort of isolated organism, uh, but a group of the same organisms together in a similar area, we call then a population. So think of the population of El Paso, population of humans. Uh, we can look at the population of fish in a lake, uh, the population of uh, fleas on a dog, uh, so we define the area and we look at the same type of individuals in that area. So we can have different analyses going on at the organismal level, at the populational level. Uh, once we look at the community, the community then is all of the populations, all the different types of populations interacting together. So we talk about El Paso Community College. So if we were on campus right now, we would have all the humans and all the pigeons around the campus, all the trees, um, all of the, the bacteria living on all the humans. So all the living entities within an area. The, the population of El Paso of humans is not uh, sort of just humans. We, we have uh, dogs, cats, birds, bacteria. Um, so there's all these living factors that, that kind of all kind of work together. And that's what we define, uh, define as the community there. Another level of complexity is all the community, all the living factors, plus all the non-living components. So all of the, uh, the non-living factors such as heat, cold, uh, rain, uh, wind, uh, rocks, all of these things have an impact on the living factors as well. So here in El Paso, we talk about not the forest ecosystem, but the desert ecosystem. We're going to get into that shortly here. So then we collectively put all of the ecosystems together. So the deserts and the forests and the underwater ecosystems. And, and we then get to this huge organizational level that we call the biosphere. So again, all of you... I suspect, most of you I suspect are going to be some sort of uh, biology major. But again, when you just say biology major, it's a little bit sort of uh, overly simplified. What level of biology are you going to work at? Uh, very few people are going to be biospheric biologists. It's a, just a tremendously complex level to study, but it's very important to study uh, factors such as global warming, uh, climate change, all these kind of things have an impact not just on one ecosystem, but the collective whole biosphere, the whole earth itself. Um, but again, most of you are going to spend your careers at the organismal level, maybe at the populational level. Some of you might become specialists. Maybe you're going to be a cardiologist. You're going to focus only on 
um, that particular organ, right? So it depends on, on what level of focus that you have, but again, all of you are gonna be within some umbrella of, of the biological sort of organization here. You're gonna work with some particular category of this um, sort of this organization. Okay, so um, I don't know what you thought of 1306. Um, I can give you my personal story, right? So um, I find 1306 challenging to teach in one way. It's very conceptual. Uh, students struggle with the chemistry and physics and it's kind of theoretical and abstract. Um, so it's difficult to teach in that regard. It's easy to teach in the aspect that it kind of progresses pretty nicely. So chapter, um, the, the, the DNA chapter progresses into like the cell chapter into the uh, mitosis chapter. So there's kind of a logical progression. For 1307, I think it's going to be easier material, but we're not going to go in a linear type of fashion. We're going to kind of go this way for a while, and then we break off and we go this way, and we're going to break off and go this way. So it's not a linear type of, uh, of material that I'm going to present this semester. So some students find that a little bit challenging. Um, but if I go back all the way to when I took 1306 as a student, I honestly didn't like 1306. Um, I always thought I was going to be, you know, some sort of biology major, you know, veterinarian, or I didn't know what, but I, I knew I was going to study something in biology. I took biology 1306. I didn't like it. I, I, I thought, man, this is not what I thought. I thought I was going to be dissecting frogs and going on field trips and this kind of stuff. And that's not what 1306 was. I almost changed my major. Uh, I went and talked to the counselor, you know, you know, I, I don't want to be a biology major anymore. It's not what I thought it was. Uh, I remember getting the speech and, well, just, um, just finish your credits, uh, take the second biology. And if you don't like it at that point, then you can change your major. Right? So I took the second biology class and fast forward to today and I'm still in biology. Um, this course, I really did like, I like the 1307, this organismal approach. And again, I, I hope that you find some interest in it as well. So we're going to look at the three themes of biology. So we get rid of chemistry, get rid of physics, no, no more of those themes, right? Now our themes are very different, and this is going to have a very different feel than the 1306 course. So our basically our first theme being ecology. So ecology is defined as the scientific study of the interactions between species and their environment. So underline here the interactions. What does that mean? So uh, I suspect this morning you interacted with your pet dog. You brushed your teeth. You interacted with bacteria. Uh, you, you, you said hi to someone in your home. You... Um, you texted somebody, right? So those are interactions that, uh, that, it, that organisms have. So ecology is going to really focus on those interactions. Some of the interactions are going to be good. Some are going to be bad. Uh, and ecology tries to address all of those. Evolution. Evolution takes us back to chapter four in 1306, the... Um, nucleic acid information, so DNA, RNA, we go to protein synthesis, the genetic basis for organisms, mutations, uh, all the things that cause change over time. So that's the evolutionary concept. Genetic changes in populations from generation to generation. And uh, Ms. Presa is gonna really focus more in this on lab. I will address this in, in class as we go through each taxonomical group, but taxonomy then becomes a science of classification, right? You may have heard of the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom. What, what do we mean? What's the difference between a plant and an animal and a mushroom and a, and a bacteria? So we're going to look at qualities, at characteristics, at uh, morphology, at phylogeny, uh, all of these things that we can look at to generate different categories. 
Uh, if we're talking about movies or, or music, different genres of, of music, genres of movies, we have different genres of, of life. And we call that then these, uh, the scientific study of taxonomy. So I'll, I'll sprinkle taxonomy in throughout the semester, ecology and evolution all will be sprinkled in and, and more than sprinkled in, these are the, like the tripod, the, uh, the support in which the uh, 1307 course is built upon, this organismal course. So again, just introducing ecology here. Ecology is gonna focus on how organisms interact with each other. And you know, why do they interact? How do they interact? Why do they not interact? Uh, it's a very holistic type of, of field. It entails a lot of information from basic biology, from biochemistry, genetics, anatomy, physiology, evolution. And what ecology, you know, the, the big theme, what ecology tries to figure out, um, what it tries to understand is the distribution and abundance of organisms. So why are some organisms found here but not here? And why are some organisms going extinct and some are overpopulating, right? So ecology tries to address all of these things. So if we look at polar bears, I don't know if you know a little bit about polar bears, uh, ecology would ask, well, why are polar bears only in the North Pole, but they don't make their way to the South Pole? So why are they only found in the Northern sort of hemisphere? Um, and why are polar bears going extinct at this uh, current uh, time? What, what factors, what genetic factors, uh, what uh, evolutionary factors, anatomy, physiology factors are in place that are not enabling this bear to basically to, uh, to adapt and evolve and continue long-term survival. Right? Um, we look at a you know, different example. So bees, uh, we know bees are actually kind of in trouble too. They're, they're having some ecological issues. Uh, why are bees very colonial? Why do bees live in big groups and not uh, as individual separate organisms? So what would be the benefit, the negative cost of, of, of living in solitary life versus in colonial life. So things to, uh, things to kind of think about as we put them within the context of ecology. Um, here we get into some vocabulary. Uh, we know bio means life. So biotic factors. So any living factor that the organism will interact with. So here we have a panda eating leaves. So leaves are alive, the plant is alive. So the living plant interacting with the living panda, that would be a biotic type of interaction. If we put, uh, uh, let's see you, you get dropped in this very desolate, uh, harsh desert there. Um, you would be interacting with the heat, with the sand, uh, and that would then be a non-living interaction. We call that abiotic. So abiotic factors are non-living. Uh, we, we're dealing with this right now in, in, you know, in El Paso. We're dealing with the hot temperature, been very windy, been very dusty, um, very, very little rain that we've had here. So all of these have a, an impact. They, they affect maybe your mood. Uh, they affect your, um, I don't know, maybe some of you like the heat. They make you happy. Some of you hate the heat. makes you all upset, hot and bothered. So. Um, Again, non-living factors can have an impact on life. It's blowing dust and all oh, you get dust in your eyes, it causes pain, can't see. That is an is a ecological interaction between you and a non-living entity, so abiotic. I am gonna be using these terms a lot, biotic and abiotic factors. So get used to hearing those, get used to um, uh, maybe utilizing those terms uh, when you answer your questions as well. So going back to our levels of organization, we, we just kind of covered these with the, the parrot slide earlier. So we know that we can study ecology at different levels. So if we're studying at the organismal level, it would be like we're studying just what's happening with this one singular cactus. Right? 
we can get we can learn information from that but we know that well plants need to interact with other of their same type to reproduce to uh maybe to have competition whatever the case is right but um this is a more common level of ecology the populational level so we're going to look at just the, the saguaro cactus in this particular mountain range right there yeah so this would be just the organismal level and then we have then the populational level well when we start to analyze ecology uh, we start to try to qualify quantify maybe um, the interaction itself is it a good interaction is it something beneficial is it something that helps the organism to survive or is it a negative or harmful interaction does it cause injury does it uh, take away resources uh, does it put stress on the organism does it make it sick that kind of stuff so uh, we're going to have to analyze different situations are they beneficial or are they harmful sometimes it's going to be very simple sometimes eh, i'm not quite sure it's debatable uh, depends on the context um, so sometimes it's more challenging to determine if the interaction itself is good or bad, if it's beneficial or harmful. So um, now we're looking at ecological analyses. This would be then at the community level. So a monkey is not the same organism as a parrot. A tiger is not the same organism as a chimp here. So I just took these pictures from the web here, but I'm curious to see your analyses, right? So would you consider the interaction between the monkey and the bird to be beneficial? Would it be harmful? Um, you look at it from both perspectives. Is the monkey getting some benefit? Is the bird getting some benefit? Is the monkey being harmed? Is the bird being harmed? So how would you critique, how would you grade uh, without knowing a whole lot of background information here but how would you grade that that interaction right and would it be the same as uh, what you see here yeah. so we start to then come up with new vocabulary if both members involved benefit from the interaction so uh, organism a benefits organism b benefits positive situation for both we call that a mutualistic situation, a mutualism. Right? If, uh, let's say, one of them benefits, but one of them is harmed. So one benefits, one's getting, uh, can't breathe, uh, or it's too much weight on my back or something. So um, then that basically would be one benefiting, one being harmed. We call that then a consumption, consumptive interaction. Uh, if both individuals are are being uh, harmed in this situation, we say that that is a competition. So two negatives, neither benefiting from that interaction, we call that competition. Um, so again, analyze this for a moment. And how would we critique what's happening here? The tiger and the, and the little chimp. At this current moment, I don't know about you, but to me, this chimp is, I don't know, that to me looks like a smile. I'm personifying things a bit here, but that looks like joy. Like, look at this little baby tiger. This is so cool, yeah. The little tiger, I don't know, it doesn't seem too, it seems sleepy, but it doesn't seem like it's having a bad time. So maybe it's feeling love, feeling, uh, likes the attention. I don't know, I would consider this a mutualistic situation maybe you would disagree like no the tiger is sleepy he wants to sleep he don't want to be bothered maybe uh, you would consider it a consumptive interaction uh, so um, now if we fast forward say five years from today this same situation may be quite different right so ecological interactions are not always the same they they, they change depending on time depending on size depending on situations um, so again, we, we critique them at the given moment, and sometimes again we get it right. Sometimes we may hypothesize it incorrectly. 
So I have a couple of pictures here. I'm very curious to know how you would critique these things. Yeah. So um, pet owner with her pet. The dog is being fed. Here we have a bee pollinating a flower. You're at the store, you give cash for certain items. And I don't know what's going on here with the lizards top left. So um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what you would think, how you would critique these types of, of ecological interactions there, right? So I'm not gonna give you the answer right now. I want you to think of it. Uh, this is something that you're gonna have to do for your first exam. So I'm gonna give you a particular scenario and you do your best to come up, well, this, I, I justify this as this, as a mutualism, or I justify it as a competition, or I justify it as a consumption. So based on just the, a very static image at the moment, how would you critique it to your best ability? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I hope that you see that these pictures are different than these interactions. Right? So uh, this interaction, uh, this interaction. Ooh, what if you're, uh, what if you're that vehicle right there, stuck in that mess, right? Uh, I hope you see this is not considered to be the same as these. I don't know. I think a lot of you may may argue that. Uh, this is going to be a mutualistic situation. Both are going to benefit. In this situation, nobody benefits. So if you're fighting, even if you win, even if you win, you're still going to have that puffy eye or the, oh, the hurt wrist, or um, you're still going to have some discomfort, some pain. So um, uh, in, in what we consider competition, nobody is considered to be getting a benefit. Even if you win, you still wasted time energy, stress, injury. Uh, so you didn't necessarily benefit from that particular interaction. So if you've ever gone up for a job interview, you know, there's a lot of qualified people that uh, force you to, to step up and you have to be on time. You have to spend money to look professional. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of stress involved. Now the company, the third party, the company will benefit from choosing the best qualified applicant, but the applicants themselves are going to uh, basically, because of competing, them, competing amongst themselves, will get that negative interaction. Uh, siblings, uh, again, siblings, siblings, even if you're the big sibling and you win, you win the toy, you're gonna get in trouble because you made the little one cry, right? So again, nobody benefits from competition. Traffic is a waste of time, a waste of gas, polluting the environment, stress, you start to get all flustered when you're stuck in traffic. So again, these are types of interactions that since neither benefit, it makes sense that we try to avoid competitive situations. And that brings us to this uh, idea of what we call resource partitioning. Resource partitioning is an ecological sort of concept that states that we, we change our behavior. In some cases, we change our body form. Um, we change to try to minimize the direct competition that's involved. So this is a, a classic example. And I use a lot of lizard examples, reptile examples. This is what I, I study a lot. So um, in this forest, we have four closely related lizards. They are able to survive in the same area because they partition their resources. They don't all try to do the same thing. It's too much competition if they do. So this one down here in the bottom right is a speed racer. It's a fast one, right? It tolerates the hottest temperature as it runs back and forth on the hot soil. Very, very fast, very nervous, very wary. Um, so it, it, it's going to out chase any of the other three. It, it, it's going to get the insects faster. Yeah? This one, top right, decide, you know what, man, that little guy is too fast. I can't, you know, out chase him, out, out race him. So what they've done, they've evolved to live in a vertical life. So they've, they've 
change their color. They have more of a camouflage sort of idea. And they're going to kind of swivel their, their ankles and wrists 180 degrees so that they can basically run up and down that, that trunk. Not as fast, but they don't need to be as fast because they're living a different lifestyle there. Right? The, the sneakiest of the group would be this little lizard here that has evolved to look like these horizontal branches. So it's living in a horizontal world, but not on the floor. It's living on the horizontal branches. It stays sort of very still, little butterflies or insects land, and, and it gets them right away that way. So it's more of a stealth type hunter. At the very top, sort of where the green leaves, when the wind is blowing, little, uh, little kind of bits of blue shine through. We have the lizard that likes the, the cooler temperature, fresher breeze, not as hot. Uh, and it has evolved a very different lifestyle up at the top. So if this lizard tried to outcompete the speed racer, it wouldn't work. If the speed racer tried to outcompete the vertical lizard here, it wouldn't be optimal. So by them changing their strategy, it enables them to all live very you know, harmoniously together there. So the whole concept, resource partitioning. Uh, decreases competition for food and for microhabitats. So that's an important sort of situation that um, I think you you are you are part of, right? So uh, let me give you this 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 idea of trying to avoid competition. Um, if you were going to get in a fight, how many of you tried to talk your way out of the fight just moments before? Hey, you know, it's your last chance, man. I don't. It's your last chance to go. I don't want to hurt you. You know, you go right. You try to talk your way out of the physical combat there. or how many of you to try to avoid traffic uh maybe you get up a little bit earlier or or you you don't go out at rush hour you try to wait till rush hour is done right so you try not to be on the highway when everybody else wants to be on the highway um it's a little bit different now but before all this covid mess uh, did you like to go shopping at uh, Walmart, at Sam's, at Costco, let's say at you know 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. I think a lot of people are at the stores at 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. So um, I know before things got all you know crazy, uh, I, I would like to go shopping eh, maybe later in the evening, or you know maybe I get up uh, um, early on a, on a Sunday morning when there's not too many people at the store, right? So by changing the time that you go to the store, you are trying to partition that resource. So you're not trying to be there at the optimal time when everybody is, uh, is trying to, uh, to, to fight for the same resources, right? Um, so maybe think of some other things that you may do uh, that give you an idea of, oh man, you know, I really hadn't thought about why I do this, but it makes sense. I'm trying to, uh, to minimize direct competition because it's going to waste my time. My energy is going to make me upset, that kind of stuff. So um, it's a, it's a concept that, that applies to a lot of uh, situations if we start to analyze uh, in detail. So all of these looking at the idea of, again, our mutualisms, trying to minimize competition. And now we're going to look at then our consumptive interactions. So in consumption, we have a positive and negative. And I got to define or just, I got to contrast between two types of consumptions. So one, predation, we have a predator and we have the prey. It's a terrible place to be if you're a little mouse. Not good. Like, oh, it wasn't a good day for the seal. Uh, what is that, a little gazelle or something? Yeah. No, too bad, so sad, they're no longer with us here. Right? So in this situation, the predator is gonna get the positive interaction and we define it as a predator because it killed for nutritional purposes, the prey item, right? So it, there was a direct killing and consumption of, of the prey. So the prey organism is directly killed by the interaction. That's the textbook technical definition. Now in ecology, we kind of bend the, uh, the definition a little bit. So let's say that you eat a hamburger 
you eat uh, fried chicken, you eat uh, carnitas, right? Well, we didn't directly kill the, the cow, the pig, the, you know, the chicken, but we still gain nutritional sort of uh, sustenance from that organism. So uh, we define ourselves then as predators. We are predators because that organism was killed for our nutritional uh, purpose. If you go and you kill a fly, right? Well, you kill it, but I hope you don't turn around and eat that fly, right? So that would not kind of fall within the realm of, of predation. Kind of, there is death, but it's not for nutritional purpose, right? So it's kind of a different, a different ecological sort of uh, definition there. We're not going to cover that one. Now, when we're talking about predators and prey, um, I would like for you to kind of sort of step back a little bit and, and, and kind of see how alert you are. Right? I'm going to venture to say that most citizens, most humans, uh, most uh, first world uh, individuals are not very alert. And, and that's kind of the benefit of living in a civilized uh, society. So uh, I think in, in a lot of cases, you don't, walk from your front door to your car nervous and scared like something's trying to kill you right um you, you have that you know yeah well you know, i'm gonna be safe you go out to the store without without not a lot of paranoia right it's a little bit different now with all the covid mess but uh, we still even to this point we still don't have the same state of alertness that wild animals have so this rabbit goes out and it, it's eating but it's never 100% uh, just focused on eating. It's always kind of trying to sense its environment. Uh, the gazelles are always, always trying to keep an eye out on the horizon. Um, and, and, and rightly so, right? Your little penguin that, I don't know, this penguin seems to have zoned out a bit here, right? It's like, well, I gotta do this and this, and I gotta do this. And I don't know if you ever find yourself just kind of staring, like zoning out. And if that happens in nature, Oops, it's not going to end well. So to continue staying alive in nature, you must have that state of alertness. And I'm going to say a lot of humans have lost that state of alertness. We don't have that. We're just very complacent when we go about our, our, our daily activity. Um, we basically have become the top of our food chain in, in most uh, environments, right? And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're not the top of the food chain, right? So uh, a lot of people are scared of uh, maybe swimming in big lakes or swimming in the ocean, right? If you're scared of swimming in the ocean, why are you scared of swimming in the ocean? Right? Well, maybe, maybe you can't swim. Well, that won't make sense. But if you can swim and you're scared of swimming in the ocean, um, well, why? Well, possibly because you think, well, maybe there's sharks down there, right? Maybe there's things that can hurt me that I'm no longer the top of the food chain. And when you feel that you're no longer top of the food chain, you start to develop that state of alertness and you start to look around and at what can harm you. Uh, because again, if you're not the top of the food chain, bad things can, uh, can happen, yeah? So not good. Um, to those of you that, uh, to, to those of you students that have served in the military, I, I, I thank you for your service. I commend you for that, uh, for putting your your health, your life, your family's, you know, uh, life as well in, in a situation where it's compromised, right? So individuals that have gone off to the military, uh, they've maybe been exposed to traumatic things. They come back uh, different, right? They come back maybe with the, the PTSD. And, and why does this happen? Right? Well, let's say you have this very young a naive individual that goes off, they see some terrible things, and all of a sudden they see they are not the top of the food chain. They cannot just go about their day without, um, you know, being at, in harm's way. Right? So, again, it, it has an impact. If you know somebody that's come back from the military, uh, they're never just quite at peace. They're always kind of looking over their shoulder. They're kind of checking things around they have that sort of wild animal type of uh, alertness that, that many uh, just uh, uh, society members don't have. Um, I don't know, maybe 
you were not in the military, but maybe you were crossing contraband. I don't know what you do, right? Uh, but these individuals live that same lifestyle, right? They're always trying to, you know, keep, you know, where's the, uh, the law enforcement, right? They're trying to stay ahead, uh, you know, ahead of them. So um, these are individuals that have reverted to a more primitive state, to a more predatory state, kill or, or be killed, basically. So it, it does have an impact on the psyche of the individual. So that was one harsh positive negative. Now we get into a lesser degree of positive negative, and we're going to call this parasitism. So in parasitism, we're going to have a positive interaction. One of these organisms is going to gain a little bit of nutrition, but it's not going to kill the host. The, to kill the host is not the goal, right? So um, we're going to call then the one that's getting the positive as the parasite, the negative as the host. So I, I bet most of you have been bitten by a mosquito. So if you've been bit by a mosquito, the mosquito then sucking blood, the mosquito is getting nutrition, positive, and you're getting a little itch, negative. So again, you might get disease, you might get infected, that kind of stuff, but the mosquito is not trying to kill you. It's just trying to take a little bit of energy uh, for it to survive. If you've been uh, parasitized by a worm, maybe your dogs have tapeworms or your dogs have ticks and fleas. Those are examples of parasites. Parasites can be external, live on the outside of the body, or they may live on in the inside of the body. Um, so again, positive and negative, but a very, very lesser degree of negative. Again, the goal of the parasite is not to kill the host. Again, the parasite is not trying to kill the host. If the host dies, the parasite we're gonna, is going to have to go and try to find another host. So sometimes a parasite does kill the host on accident, uh, but that wasn't the actual ecological goal. You know, we're going to talk about that a little bit later in, in context of other parasites. So I'm going to post a video on a different type of parasitism we're gonna call brood parasitism. So keep an eye out for the, the link to watch this video. Uh, and then we'll discuss it in the next discussion. Uh, so that's the video. And if we analyze now humans, right? So somebody say, oh, look at that little cute little baby. An ecologist would say, oh, look at that cute little parasite. Oh, well, um, is that true? Do you believe that a baby would be considered a parasite? It's kind of harsh, no? Um, but is a baby getting a positive and causing a negative to the hosts, to the parents? Right? If we analyze, I don't know, babies, uh, when they're developing, right? For the first nine months, the baby's taking energy from mom, taking calcium from mom, putting stress and pressure on mom's body. Uh, the baby's born. Uh, so basically, mom is uh, sort of making uh, nutrition to nurse the baby, right? So take, 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 take. The baby's giving back diapers and, and, and crying, and babies are expensive, right? So I don't know. Uh, what do you think? What do you think? Is this true? Are, are babies actually parasites? Uh, and if they're parasites, do they ever shift out of that parasitic mode? I don't know. Maybe analyze yourself. Or are are you still in parasitic mode? Are you still, oh, you know, hey, mom, uh, dad, uh, can I borrow 50 bucks? Uh, can I, you know, get uh, this or that? Um, at what point then do we shift that, that, uh, that category? What, at what point do we shift from being a parasite now to uh, repaying back what was given from the parents, right? So hopefully that happens. Um, hopefully late in life when mom and dad are old, they need your help. Now you're the one giving, 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 right? So I, I don't know. I, I personally don't think as children, we're ever going to be able to repay everything our parents did for us. But um, again, if we don't even try, we're always going to live that whole life of being a, a parasitic individual. So things to consider, um, the idea of ecological parasitism. So again, um, I hope this is making sense. So I'm almost done here with this first lecture. Uh, we've looked at the idea of ecology at the uh, populational level, community level, 
we can consider ecology at the ecosystem level and also at the biospheric level. It just gets more dynamic as we get into larger levels here. So the ecosystems, zoologists, biologists, we call these ecosystems. If you're a botanist, if you're a plant person, plant people call these biomes. Right? They categorize the whole ecosystem based on the dominant plant life. If your dominant plant is a cactus, uh, you're probably in a desert. If your dominant plant life is these huge tropical trees, you're probably in a forest. If your dominant, plat, if your dominant plant is grass, you're in a grassland. Right? But again, the dominant plant sustains that environment. The more grass there is, the more plant eating animals can survive and the more uh, biodiversity that can be sustained there. Yeah? So our ecology changes as our ecosystems change as well. Okay, so that's gonna summarize then our ecology. That's one of our first themes we're gonna carry throughout the whole course. So uh, with that, I don't want the videos to get, you know, super, super long. They take uh, longer to download and stuff, but um, let me stop uh, this here. So uh, watch the video, soak all that in and, and learn what you can. And I will continue uploading videos uh, as we continue throughout the week. All right. So for now, y'all have a good one. I'll see you next time.